name is Victor Chakterisky. I was born October 3rd, 1953 in New York City. And did you stay in New York City your entire life? I was my entire life. I've lived in New York City except for a three-year period when I was in my 20s when I lived in Albany, New York. Okay, and um, in what neighborhood did you live when you were growing up? In, in the East Village in Manhattan, which is called the East Village because it's east of uh, Greenwich Village, which is the West Village. And it is north of Houston Street, between Houston Street and 14th Street. And it is east of 3rd Avenue. And can you describe what that was like living in New York at that time? Well, when I was growing up, and we're going back to when I was remembering when I was an adolescent, was it was a very different neighborhood than it is now. It wasn't as gentrified. It was more of an immigrant neighborhood, which is why I was I was living there because uh, my parents and their grandparents were immigrants who came here in the 1950s, early 1950s, after World War II. Uh, also, it when I was. I think it went through the hippie movement, which was in the 1960s, and East Village was a very popular place for it, just like Haight-Asbury was in, uh, in uh, San Francisco. So it went through numerous periods, uh, which were very different. And in the 70s, when New York City was going bankrupt, and uh, there was a flight of people to the suburbs, uh, this area went downhill, and it was actually quite quiet. And there was more crime than now. So let me give you a walkthrough. In the 50s, I don't remember, I was too young. When it got into the 60s, I remember that Third Avenue go, going east goes into First Avenue, then you get what you call Alphabet Cities, which is Avenue A, B, C, and D, and then you have the East River. As I was growing up from Avenue A on, the whole area started going very much downhill uh, to the point where buildings were being abandoned by the landlords because people wouldn't pay the rent. There was not much they could do about it. Crime was high. As a matter of fact, I had read that at one point, the police station on 5th Street, which was Precinct 9, it was the 9th Precinct, rather, did not patrol east of Avenue B. They just had to go there unless there was a call. So that's the kind of neighborhood I grew in. As I, was, as I was growing up as a kid, you were likely to say what you were called, you, you were jumped, meaning other kids jumped you and harassed you or robbed you. So that was a risk. So you went out less at night and you didn't go in the east direction. Uh, it was a rougher neighborhood. It was less of a developed neighborhood. It was a transitional neighborhood for immigrants and poor people. Uh, it didn't have the gentrification the way it comes economic development. So I guess it attracted in the 60s, this kind of neighborhood attracted the young kids going out the hip, so to speak, who ran away from home, who found a, a, a place here to live, etc. cetera, where it came crime and other things, drugs open drug use, uh, drug dealing, etc. At the grammar school, I went to St. George Ukrainian Catholic School, which was on 7th Street, between 2nd and 3rd Avenue. So my whole life revolved around the neighborhood, which was very Ukrainian. It was also Polish, it was Jewish, and when you went east, it was Spanish, it was Puerto Rican. Right now, I think NYU grew much more over the years, For now, their students number of 30,000 in the area, so they also populated the parents' rent apartments in the area. So with expansion of NYU, this area got more students. I know I'm rambling, but I kind of giving it to you the way it was going. Uh, I know when my father tells me, your new grandfather, when he first moved here, the L was still on Third Avenue, the elevated subway. They took it down, I believe, sometime in the 50s. I don't remember it. He tells me when he showed up, it was a very dirty place with the L. It was dark. That's where all the bumps were, the vagrants, homeless people, etc. 
when they took down the L and redid uh, and refinished Third Avenue, they cleaned it up a lot and opening it all up. And when the 70s came in, that's when I entered college. I was going by Silver to City College up at 137th Street in Broadway, so I lived in the house and I commuted back and forth. And he sold the latter part, starting 1977 going forward, I was out of the city until I came back in the early 1980s. Uh, the mid-1980s, when you started seeing a growth, the gentrification, where uh, the baby boomers started looking for apartments, they started, you know, moving out of their own, so that created a desire for apartments. So I remember in the 1980s, there was a development, and slowly Alphabet City, which was like no man's land, and the buildings that were abandoned and forgotten about were now being brought up and it developed slowly by developers. And that was a long going process. I mean, what we're talking about didn't happen overnight. It happened over a couple of decades. The first building, for example, let's, let's take Tompkins Square Park, which is the park in the area that I grew up, which is between 7th Street and 10th Street between Avenue A and Avenue B. Tompkins Square Park, you didn't go to at night. Avenue A was dead in the evening. There was only a luncheonette that you went there during the day. Um, and the first developer in the 1980s to buy a building bought like a 12-story building that almost looked institutional on the Avenue B side, and there was a huge demonstration against it because the locals did not want uh, that intrusion. So what you had was you had abandoned buildings being lifted by vagrants that were slowly being taken over, either demolished by the city and auctioned off by the city to try to develop the area and develop a slow and moving in. This started in the 80s and we're now in 2016. The East Village has, has gone through a tremendous change. Well, as an architect, I see the construction going on and I see it from an architectural point of view. I mean, it could be a, a reflection partially in society. It's also more a reflection on how people use spending money. And also you start competing as development continues and you're approaching saturation and development, which we have done before in New York City on the commercial end and even on the housing in the late 80s and into the 90s, then you were saturated. When you get to into saturation, you're getting into competition. I think right now we're going to a more innovative architecture, residential and commercial, for two reasons. One of the technology that allows us to do it. Two is new building codes which have a higher uh, requirement for seismic, for example, which which means masonry costs more money. So people move into developers and construction moves into glass and steel, but at the same time as to attract people, attract foreign investors in the residential real estate, that you start changing and making more innovative uh, architecture. So one of the good things is, is as you get into money, as you get into competition, your architecture and the quality of your infrastructure and your buildings uh, gets better. When you are, for example, and this is blunt but very true, if you're building subsidized housing for the government, it's going to be not as, an, as attractive and innovative as you are building for upper-end luxury clientele because they will pay more and you can spend more in construction. Uh, the other thing is our government has gone back to looking to build monumental uh, architecture, monumental buildings. When we look at our old uh, uh, public buildings, they were monumental masterpieces, even as they say they were in, uh, in the classic styles with, with Corinthian columns, stone, etc. And then our government municipal developments went into boxes and straightforward construction. And now we're going back to the monumental construction because we're realizing the benefit of it. Uh, classic example, Penn Station. Penn Station, uh, Penn Station was built in the early 20th century. I think it was one of the most iconic architectural masterpieces that were built, was built in America. It was torn down in the 1960s when the railroads couldn't afford it anymore. It was rebuilt. 
at a small scale underground to allow for Madison Avenue and was built by the city. Everybody hates it, everybody thinks it, it, it's a, a horrible example of what happened. As one said it, and I think eloquently says it all, when we once entered like gates, we now exit like rats. Because the people are running up the stairs out of the underground, out of the station. And before you went the monumental classic of building that was absolutely beautiful. Now, Governor Cuomo is talking about rebuilding Penn Station back into something that's elegant and monumental again. So that's what I'm saying is when you talk about architecture, neighborhoods, and our city and the way it's going, it is fueled, the quality of it and the expense of it is fueled by money private and the desire by the government of what it wants to do. I think that our governments, I don't know if they're wealthier now or if they're willing to go into more debt now in order to create something better. That I don't have an answer for. But it certainly is much better than the quality of the construction in the 60s and 70s. On both sides, private and public. I think it's also cultural of what people decide to make. Okay, so one closing question. Uh, where where are you right now? Where, where are you located at this moment? Right now I'm sitting uh, in an office on 2nd Avenue uh, between uh, 9th and, uh, and 8th Streets. So how far away well, is that we, from uh, where you grew up? I'm a block away from where I was born. I'm a block and a half and across the street where I grew up during my high school years. And I'm two blocks away where I grew up going to grammar school. Okay, so I guess you came full circle. Yeah, I'm still home. I'm home. Yeah, okay. Guisha Jaku Tato. Okay. Papa. Papa.